Hi friends, I'm Tarek Brown, President and CEO of Sokoa Aging and In-Home Solutions. While you stay socially distant for a short while longer, we wanted to offer something fun to do each month, something we're calling Cabin Fever Cures. In April, our thoughts turn naturally to all things spring, and that includes spring cleaning. Now, that doesn't have to be overwhelming and it doesn't have to be dreary. We've invited Kristen Murney of 10bykristen.com to provide some inspiration. Kristen looks at the world a little differently, bringing beauty, comfort, functionality, and a little whimsy to every living space. In our first segment, Kristen will share some helpful organization tips to eliminate clutter and bring balance and order to chaos. Mental and emotional health is strongly influenced by our surroundings. So before you invite guests back into your home, let's make sure everything is clean and welcoming. Then in our second segment, she'll come back and give some tips on the ancient practice of feng shui to help bring a sense of balance to your home and make it feel open and inviting. If you're not familiar with us, Sokoa is a not-for-profit in central Indiana that empowers older adults and people of any age with intellectual, developmental, or medical disabilities to remain comfortably and safely at home and out of institutional care. If you have questions about long-term services and support for yourself or a loved one, please call our Aging and Disability Resource Center at 317-803-6131 or visit sokoa.org. Now let's get started with our cabin fever cure for April. Take it away, Kristen. Hello everybody, I am Kristen Murney. I'm the owner of 10 by Kristen. I do interior decorating, home organization, and feng shui consultations. So it's spring, happy spring everyone. And after 2020, I don't know about you, but I am ready to purge that year completely. And so let's talk about spring cleaning. I know that it's not necessarily what you are excited about, but think of it as just taking the first step of a journey. Um, every long journey begins with that first step. So just do a little bit at a time. I really encourage people to not look at a project as a whole. Like when I look at my whole kitchen, I'm like, Ooh, nope, I'd rather go sit on the couch and eat bonbons. That's too much work. But if you just block off 15, 30 minutes to do one cabinet, or maybe a couple hours, if you have a Saturday that you can block off two or three hours, you can do sections at a time. I always tell people to start from the top to the bottom. So let's talk about going all the way up to the top and dusting the top of the kitchen cabinets. It's, it, you don't have to do this every year, but because you don't do this every year, it's gonna need it. So if you haven't done it in a couple of years, make sure you go all the way to the top, give it a good dusting, get the cobwebs out of there. Um, and then I like to tell people to start with opening up your cabinet doors and clearing everything out of there. So if you're just doing one cabinet at a time, that's great. But do also think in advance, like, do I want all of these things to go back into the same cabinet or do I maybe want to move them? So kind of keep that in mind if you're only doing a section at a time. You might need to do like this cabinet here. I want to switch with the, that cabinet over there. So you might need to do those at the same time. Um, but you have everything emptied out of the section that you're going to be working on. And when you do that, you're then going to go in and wipe down the inside of your cabinet itself. But get the top of the cabinet and the walls of it too, because dust will stick to all surfaces. So give it a good cleaning on the inside. When you're cleaning things, you're going to want to clean the doors on the inside and the outside as well. Clean your hardware. Um, just a good deep clean while you're at this. Now, all of your stuff has been sitting out on the counter or on the floor, and as you're going to start putting things back in, be thoughtful about it. You don't wanna necessarily just shove everything back in the cabinet. I mean, do you have 17 water bottles? Do you need 17 water bottles? Maybe you donate five or six of them. Maybe you do a yard sale. It's spring season, get to know your neighbors and make a little cash so you can go buy some flowers to plant. So. Be thoughtful with what all you're going to put back in. Um, and then make sure as you're putting things back in the cabinets that you are wiping them down so the items that are going back in are clean as well. Um, this applies to any room in the house. 
Um, we'll talk about closets in a minute, but at bathroom cabinets, your coat closet, um, even your garage, start from top to bottom and really be thoughtful about what you are going to be keeping in that space. All right, so we've gotten done with the kitchen. Let's move into our closet spaces. Um, in your closet space, I do recommend the same thing where maybe you just take a section at a time, but I want you to empty everything out of that section and be very thoughtful about what you're putting back in. Now, here's a little pro tip for you. Um, can you remember if, when the last time was that you wore, let's say, this? Well, when you go to hang it back up in your closet, hang it with the hanger backwards. That way, as you start to wear your clothes, you can turn them with the hanger turned correctly or in the easier access way. And then next year or next season, when you go to check and see what you've worn over the last year, you'll know, well, gee, I didn't wear that. And you'll know to donate that. So a second pro tip is hanging your pants over your shirts. Look at how much room I have. But if I hang shirts above, I've suddenly lost a lot of room up, up in this shoulder space in your closet. So if you have double hung rods, pants above shirts, it gives you more light in your space and it also helps you find your pants quickly, find your shirts quickly. It's just a little tr trick of the trade that I've learned over the years. Um, another great tool to utilize in a closet is storage bins. So in here we have one that kind of hides the clutter, my husband's socks. So that way you don't have to look at just wadded up socks. He knows that they're in there. He knows this is where he goes to get his big wool socks, but I don't have to look at them. However, up above, you can see I've used clear bins because I need to know what's in those. These are Halloween costumes. So that way I can kind of know, well, I need to pull down the Halloween costume bin as opposed to my Christmas sweater bin. I can see what's in those that are up above. So closet spaces, again, just like the kitchen, empty everything out, hang your hangers backwards when you put them back in so that way you know what you've worn over the season and then pants above shirts. So when you're ready, don't forget about your bathrooms. Now you're gonna wanna clean your cabinets just like we talked about in your kitchen, start from top to bottom again um, and clear everything out. You're gonna have some things that have been in there for a while, go ahead and get rid of them beauty products and lotions and things like that do have a shelf life. So make sure that you are getting rid of things that have been sitting for a while. But also keep in mind creative storage solutions. For example, these over the door shoe racks are a miracle for organizing things. Um, here I've used it in my linen closet to hold my boo-boo bunny, my deodorant, my extra hair gel, extra face wash, and even the hooks on it, you can hang your extra loofahs up above. So there's tons of room to store things in these shoe racks. You can also roll up towels, like hand towels or, or washcloths. Um, these can be used for a whole wide variety of storage in your linen closet, which helps free up some shelf space for things like your beach towels and your sheets and things like that that you need larger room for. So put your little stuff in these shoe hangers. So I showed you the over the door shoe storage in the bathroom. It's also a great storage solution for a coat closet where you can put your gloves and your scarves or a game closet where your decks of cards or maybe some of your smaller um, like bananagrams or handheld games can kind of go. Here is a whole spread of other storage solutions that you can use for these over the door shoe racks. I threw some cat toys into this one cleaning solutions fit in here really easily too. Sometimes you'd be surprised at how far these things can stretch actually. So cleaning solutions, your art supplies, so rulers and things like that can fit in here. Barbies is a great solution uh, or a great storage solution. You just shove your Barbies in, that way your kids can see what toys they're choosing from when they're opening up their closet doors and picking from their toy collection on the back of the door. I have some stuffed animals here too. I know a lot of kids can have big stuffed animal collections. If you need to get them out of the way, they'll be able to still see them all when they open up their doors and have them hanging there. Tools out in the garage, tape measures fit right in there. Um, pantry, if you have a pantry door that swings open all the way, you can put your spices in there and be able to see all of your spices at once 
or even snacks. So chip bags or individual packages of, of treats or fruits, all of those can fit into these over the door storage, technically shoe holders, but I don't need them for shoes, they're for everything. Kristen, thank you for the encouragement to get organized and for the reminder that getting rid of unnecessary and unused items really simplifies our lives. If you're enjoying this presentation, we hope you'll share it with friends and family. We're also asking that you make a donation to support services for seniors. The average price of the over-the-door shoe rack is between $10 and $30. So we invite you to donate that amount to help isolated older adults get the help they need to stay safe at home. Just click on the link provided. You can also find some handouts on today's presentation there. Now back to Kristen, who will teach us how to incorporate elements from the ancient practice of feng shui to help bring a sense of balance to our homes. Kristen? One of the additional services that 10 by Kristen offers is feng shui consulting. And feng shui can be intimidating for us Midwesterners sometimes because it's Chinese. Feng shui is Chinese. It actually translates to wind, water. Um, but what feng shui is, is the ancient Chinese method of using your surroundings to make you feel comfortable. Using your furniture, um, decorations, light, fabrics, colors to really create a welcome environment for you and your guests. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about feng shui today. Like I said before, it translates to wind water. And one of the key pieces of feng shui is actually the yin yang symbol. Um, I know a lot of people like to call it the yin yang, but that is the yin yang twins. That's a music group. The yin yang is the black and white round symbol that you see today on your screen. The yin yang translates to yin being female or moon and yang Tran, uh, translates to male or sun. So when you combine these two, the yin portion of the yin yang symbol is the dark side. It is the feminine curved side of feng shui. Uh, the yang sign, excuse me, the yang side is the masculine side. It's hard, it's geometric, um, it's the brighter section of the yin yang symbol. So you see in the photo here that I, sh uh, it's just a, a photo of a living room, but there's yin and yang represented in lots of different ways. There are sofas that are soft, which represents yin. Um, the sunlight in the room is a yang element. Um, the flooring is a nice hard wood, and so therefore it's straight lines, angular, that makes it yang. Um, flowers in the room or the circular pattern on the rug, those represent yin. So you can kind of see how a space has both elements as you're looking at this photo. The next photo is actually a picture of my living room rug that I like to use to show how one thing can represent yin and yang in multiple ways. So yin is the rug itself because it's soft, the color black, the swirls in that, and then the circle patterns in the rug are all representative of yin. But Yang is represented in here with the color beige because it's light. It's represented by the squares because those are geometric patterns. It's a busy patterned rug, which makes it more energetic, which helps represent Yang as well. And then the wood floor beneath it is angular and therefore a Yang representation. So you can see that just one piece brings balance to a space. Another aspect of feng shui is the five elements. And I'll go through those here with you to kind of show you how you can bring balance to your space with all five elements included. The elements are fire, earth, metal, water, and wood. Not necessarily in that order. <laughs> earth is the first one we'll talk about. It can be represented with clay sculptures or bricks, um, stoneware if you have pottery in your home. Displaying those types of things in a space would actually help represent your earth element. Um, images of mountains or soil. Um, so, and this can be even family portraits that if you are maybe at the Grand Tetons and you have the mountains in the background, 
Even with your family in that, it's still representative of Earth because you're seeing the mountains. Um, the other, gen I, I, I would say generic, but easy ways to incorporate Earth are the shape of a square and the colors yellow and brown. The metal element can be represented with silver and gold. I mean, obviously, it's metal. Um, copper cookware is another way to bring metal into a space. So when you're thinking of metal accents, think maybe picture frames. So if you're trying to add a little bit more balance to a space and you've got a lot of wood picture frames, maybe trade a couple of them out for a silver picture frame or a gold. Um, metal sculptures is another way to bring metal elements into your home or wind chimes by your front or your back door. Um, the shape of a circle and the color white are also representative of metal. Water is represented um, with the colors black, navy blue, and dark gray, and can be represented in a lot of different ways by in actual water itself, with fountains, um, aquariums, or fish bowls, but you have to make sure you keep them clean and you have healthy fish. Um, a clear vase with clean water, so if you, keep, if you like to have fresh flowers in your house, make sure you change the water on that regularly so the glass and the water are clear. You can also use a dish with floating flowers or candles. And then this is an interesting thing to kind of keep in mind is in your kitchen or your bathroom, your water fixtures and even your refrigerator, if it has water or ice making capabilities, those are contributing to the water energy in your space. So in your bathroom, it's, it's considered to be one of the heavy water spaces because it's mostly water fixtures in there. Whereas in your kitchen, that is where we talk about the fire element. Your stove, oven, and microwave balance out the aspect of your refrigerator or your sink. So your appliances in your kitchen kind of balance out. Other aspects of fire, um, we talked about this in the original photo of how natural daylight, um, bright light helps represent the element of fire. Candles in a fireplace, actual flames um, are clearly representative of fire. The shape of a triangle, the colors red, dark orange, and bright pink. And then animal prints or animal sculptures. And then a fun little add addition to the fire element is your pets can actually represent fire. If you have happy, healthy pets in your home, they are contributing to the fire energy of your space. And finally, we have wood. Um, wood elements can be brought in with living plants with woody stems. So you see here some examples of bamboo. Um, and then there's also images of trees. So again, if you have a family trip and you're out in the woods, take some pictures and display those to help increase your wood element. Wood carvings and sculptures are also representative of wood, um, as is the color green. Uh, but one thing that I like to keep clear is that furniture itself, even if it's wood furniture, does not necessarily represent the wood element. Wood furniture is not really given new life like a wood carving or a sculpture is. So um, even if you have wood furniture, it helps a little bit with your wood element, but not nearly as much as something that's really being brought to life like a sculpture would be. So those are your five elements. Some additional ways to incorporate feng shui into your home without even really knowing that you're doing it sometimes is at your front door. Make sure that you don't have a mirror facing your front door directly. You don't want the energy that's coming into your home to be bounced right back off that mirror and back outside. The front door of your home is considered the mouth of your home. So even if you don't use it regularly, make sure that the energy that's being projected into your front door is positive energy. Um, if you use the door to your garage more frequently, that is an important door and you wanna make sure it's free of clutter to, to keep your energy going in the home, but the home's energy really comes from your front door. Another front door correction, if you will, is a lot of homes have uh, staircases coming right down and meeting at the foot, or the foot of the staircase meets right at the front door. Um, that is, considered a rush of energy that's rushing towards your front front door. So a great way to remedy this is to have a, fix, a light fixture there at the base of the stairs that maybe has some crystals incorporated into it. Um, crystals help disperse energy. Um, energy is called qi in feng shui. It can be spelled a number of different ways, but your qi, you want to make sure that it's flowing throughout the home. Everything has qi. We as people have qi. Um, our pets have chi, but so does every piece of furniture and every rock. I know it seems silly to think a rock 
has energy, but it, it, if you have things placed in a certain way and, and maybe you have a boulder placed out in your front yard and something's just not right about it, it needs to be moved a, like six inches to the left. It's because it is producing an energy that affects the flow of the energy around you. So kind of keep that in mind as you're placing things. Um, there are some other rules about how to use mirrors in your home as well. So we talked about your front door. You don't want it to be bouncing the energy out your front door. So place your mirror maybe to the side of the door um, so it bounces the energy into the home. You do not want to be able to see your reflection while you're eating. So make sure if you have a mirror hanging in your dining room that it's hung high enough that you don't see people as they are sitting at the table. Um, another one is bedrooms. You should not be able to see your reflection from your bed. So if you have the head of your bed up against a wall, you could hang a mirror on that same plane um, where the mirror is basically at the same, on the same wall as your headboard, um, but you don't wanna be able to see it or see the mirror or your reflection from your bed. And then the last one is one of my favorites, um, is making sure that you hang your mirrors at the proper height. Uh, I've actually been in a restaurant recently where the mirror was hung, where even when you're washing your hands, you had to squat to look into it. That's actually considered beheading your energy or beheading your chi. You want mirrors to be hung so that people can comfortably look into them while they are standing. And I know that that can be difficult if you have people of different heights in your home, but kind of keep it in mind and be careful about the sizes of your mirrors at that point. Maybe you need to get a slightly longer mirror so that both people can see their reflection and that their energy is not beheaded. We talked about yin and yang. Make sure that the balance of yin and yang is going throughout your home and the balance of the elements for, the same, for that same matter. Like, look around your space and see, do I have a lot of busy patterns in here or a lot of bright lights or bright colors? Especially in bedrooms, you wanna tone that down because a bedroom is where a resting place should be. Um, bedrooms, for example, um, should not have televisions in them because televisions, even though they're turned off, are still an energy producing um, device. And so that's, it's stirring up the energy in the room, even if it's not in use. Um, another thing that, about televisions that you might not think about, we talked about not being able to see your reflection from bed. Well, a TV a lot of times is a reflective surface and more often than not, it's placed at the foot of the bed. So you're able to see your reflection in the TV when it's turned off and that just defeated the purpose of not putting mirrors in place. So be careful with the kind of things that you place around your bedrooms, especially. Um, but everywhere in your home, take a look around and make sure you're incorporating all of the elements and a little bit of yin and yang throughout the entire space. It's really going to make a big difference in your home when you're considering this and, and how you feel in your space. That's really what feng shui is all about. Thank you, Kristen for demonstrating the concept of yin yang and how to create balance in our homes by incorporating elements of earth, fire, water, metal, and wood. Thanks also to you, our donors, for helping us bring light and balance to others through your support. Don't forget to check back in May for our final cabin fever cure with some ideas for container vegetable and flower gardening. Until then, let's continue spreading the love and making 2021 better and brighter.